person B, volleyball practice. Pulled muscle. Of course he's gonna injure himself. He's not focusing on the ball there. <laughs> it reminds me of this old study that was done by the AA. 29% of male drivers admit to having a near miss because of being distracted by an attractive woman. You asked for it and so you have got it. We are watching Three stories, which is one of the highest rated house episodes of all time. Let's see how my diagnostic skills compare to those of Dr. House. Let's get started. I need your help. You know you're a good doctor when not your mom, not your brother, but your ex comes to you for medical advice. House has made it. Could be indigestion. Or maybe a kidney stone, a little one. Kidney stones can be of hugely varying size between a grain of sand or even up to five inches in diameter, which is the Guinness World Record for a stone. There are a few things that make them more common and those are dehydration, being in a hot country, uh, or eating high non-dairy protein like from red meat or chicken. So Jordan Peterson, your carnivore diet may cause you some pain down the line if it doesn't already in the bathroom. So if you are thinking about taking that dream holiday to the Bahamas, make sure you stay hydrated unless you want an uninvited five inch guest to crash the party. Three guys walk into a clinic. Their legs hurt. What's wrong with them? I'm not gonna like you, am I? I'm not. Wait, 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 wait. They've gotten the least lovable person in the series to share the same tie as me. Okay, I need a new wardrobe. I said three people. That's six legs. So you got three hurt jogging, two in collisions, and one of the legs is pregnant. So House makes a really good point here. Actually, 80% of statistics are wrong, including this one. So in medicine, to be honest, like for example, if you've got a cough that's coming to you, statistically, it's gonna be a virus that causes it, but there are a small percentage that's something more worrying, and this is what differentiates a good doctor from a bad doctor. Good doctor will always be asking themselves, is this the patient that has something more worrying going on? And that doesn't mean that they'll x-ray every single patient who comes in with a cough. Uh, that would be totally unnecessary, but it could mean they could discover things that make a more dangerous diagnosis more likely, like an advanced age, or if they smoke, or have got some symptoms of weight loss, or maybe, I know it sounds really obvious, but you'd be surprised what people don't tell you unless you ask, coughing up blood. Person A. Farmer says he was fixing a fence. Tightness in the ankle, loss of muscle control. Ah, uh, interesting. So it seems like they're gonna split the presentations up into three different ones, and hence the name, three stories. So person A, what am I thinking? Well, if they've lost use of their muscle, that doesn't sound like a standard muscle strain. Uh, that sounds more like it's neurological, especially with the background the person is a farmer, that they are exposed to all kinds of livestock, they've got long grass around, usually in more remote areas. So I'm thinking things like maybe rabies or anthrax uh, or even Q fever. All very funky, but you can always expect something <laughs> strange to happen in a house. Person B, volleyball practice. It was a pulled muscle. <laughs> oh my god, okay. I'm gonna pick the low hanging fruit on here, shamelessly. How much did this man pay to be in that room? Of course he's gonna injure himself. He's not focusing on the ball there. <laughs> it reminds me of 
this old study that was done by the AA, 29% of male drivers admit to having a near miss because of being distracted by an attractive woman. <laughs> Uh oh. I know it's hard, but we can do better, guys. Think above the belt. Feels and hold muscle. And see, we got Carmen Electra golfing. Okay, just when I said think above the belt. Now, knee injuries are actually really common during golfing, uh, and the knee's made of a complex structure of cartilage acting as shock absorbers and ligaments acting as cords of rope that are connecting bones together and you can get uh, sprains of both of them and tears or even tendonitis uh, which happens in the knee but also in the elbow where it is actually named after the sport and there's a condition called golfer's elbow that exists two hours one of these three will be tossed out of the hospital because they were faking it to score narcotics and one will be very close to death. Any guesses on which is which? Okay. I think the silence is appropriate there because we don't have enough information yet really to know which one could be the sick one. My gut feeling is telling me the sick one is the farmer and the one who is trying to score narcotics would be the golfer, but who knows, anything could happen. If I think that, that's probably because they want me to and it's totally wrong, so we'll see. Some inception mind games going on here. It's a very short list. Any history of bone cancer, osteogenesis imperfecta, or multiple myeloma? Could be a blood issue. We should run a CBC and a D-dimer. And get an MRI. MRI or a PET scan. If the problem's vascular, he's better <laughs> off. Sorry, thanks for playing. Patient's dead. In real life, that just would not happen. You've got observations for anyone who doesn't come in as an emergency before the doctor even sees them. So you know how sick someone is, uh, even w before you know what is it wrong with them. Uh, so this scenario wouldn't happen. Although it, it makes for some good television. What? Puncture. Snake bite. That would be my guess. Farmer didn't know he'd been bitten by a snake. That's what he said. Sudden shooting pain. Tall grass, never saw a thing. What kind of snake? You want me to tell you what kind of snake it was from the shape of the hole in the leg? Well, how are we supposed to know what kind of antivenom to use if we don't know what kind of snake it is? So, if you were wondering about why the farmer's leg looked silky smooth, it's simply because of House's fantasy. They're still talking about patient A, and they suspect now he's got a snake bite. Now, to me, that's doesn't seem too right. I know they blurred the image on purpose, but to, a snake bite usually has two puncture wounds and they tend to be fairly small compared to the one that we saw just then. So that makes me think actually it could be a bite of something else. I mean, he was in the long grass, it could be a tick and there are plenty of tick-borne diseases that can cause paralysis, uh, like tick paralysis or uh, even Lyme disease can cause a little bit of paralysis as well. For his sake, I hope it's true because getting treated with anti-venom in the US is a very expensive feat, costing about $14,000 per treatment. Let's say we check in on the volleyball player. You have tendonitis. Oh, okay, back to patient B who has tendonitis. What is tendonitis? Well, as doctors, we really d developed our own language because why would we want anyone else to know what we're talking about? What? So if you see itis at the end of any word ever, that means inflammation. And the word before it means where that inflammation is. So tendonitis means inflammation of the tendon. So what tendon are they talking about here? Well, it's the tendon that goes between the kneecap and the shin, and it comes from the quadriceps, which is the big muscle at the front of the leg, uh, which basically helps you to kick forward. 
To be able to help heal it, you can give anti-inflammatory medication and some ice to the area, as well as keeping it elevated. Usually it takes two to three weeks, and you can also do some physiotherapy with some light loading to the area, making sure not to recreate any pain. How can you avoid it from happening? Well, it really is just avoiding your natural urge to push yourself too hard and taking things slow, especially when you're picking up a new sport and not jumping steps. Slow and steady really does win the race. Do something! Too much pain to be a slip disc. Help me! He's not gonna tell us anything if we don't get him out of pain. Give him 50 milligrams of Demerol. We have no history, he could be allergic. What do I do? We can't diagnose him while he screams. Better than killing him with painkillers that... We screwed up. Nope. You did exactly what his attending did. And that was the proper way to handle the case? Yeah. The guy used him as a dealer. You're gonna see a lot of drug-seeking behavior in your practice, and there's a reason it works. So this raises a really interesting point, and I think the medical community does have to take responsibility for so many patients being hooked on painkillers, especially looking back to some of the scandals. If you haven't seen Dope Sick, you really need to watch it. It's basically about a company which created OxyContin and convinced doctors that it didn't have addictive properties, even though it did, manipulated the research and basically turned doctors into their little prescribing machines that got a lot of patients hooked on this medication and ended up on obscene doses of it. Some actually died as a result and nobody from the pharmaceutical company ended up um, basically being arrested or fined from it because it went bust. It's also a really good reason why research articles need to be criticized a lot for having bad methods or even if they're sponsored by the pharmaceutical company that they're researching then to make sure that the trial is reproduced somewhere else that's less biased because pharmaceutical sponsored trials are 33 percent more likely to show a significant benefit to a particular drug compared to third-party studies. There's a lot of bias available there when industry is sponsoring. Hey, how you doing? All right. Thank you. This will start making you feel better really fast. So giving antivenom when the person doesn't have a snake bite doesn't usually cause any problems, but there's always a risk of allergic reaction with unnecessary medications that can happen. I really don't think this is actually a snake bite, but let's see what happens. He's having an allergic reaction. Bag. Not a snake bite. Paddles an epi. His heart is fine. He's not gonna stay that. Anaphylaxis. Paddles. Ah, uh, Dr. House? It's been almost six minutes. There he is again, ruining my Thai's reputation. What does it all mean? Wrong snake. We tried every other anti venom we had. We're too late? Yep. He's dying. How do they teach you how to tell someone that they're dying? There really is an art to this and currently on my palliative care rotation uh, the doctors around are really good at doing this but some are not we had a patient come to us in the hospice who the surgeon had mentioned that actually you might die and there is a clot in your nose that could dislodge at any point and you will bleed out of that clot uh, and die just in those plain words, essentially leaving the patient feeling as though they had a ticking time bomb in their nose. It's good that he shared information with the patient, but you have to do it in the right way and make sure that there are strategies in place so that if that does happen, the patient knows that they can you know, be kept as comfortable as possible. 
rather than that they will basically be dying a gruesome, painful death, which, of course, nobody really wants. I am. It wasn't a snake bite, was it? Ooh. See, I mean, it didn't look like a snake bite, but to be fair, it seems like it's a dog bite now, and it doesn't look quite like that either. But I guess if they made it look so obvious, then there would be no fun in it. Very interesting. Brown. And brown. What causes brown? Waste. Which means the kidneys are shutting down. Why? Trauma. And that his history would indicate. Could be damage done by the self-injection of the Demerol. Treatment? Heat and rest. Other possible causes. Infection. Start him on antibiotics. What else? Come on, come on! I, I don't know. This is a really hard one, but brown usually means acute tubular necrosis, which is basically bits of the duct inside the kidney uh, have actually reduced their oxygen or blood flow uh, or they've been exposed to a toxin and that leads to cell death and comes out in the urine leading to an extra brown color as well as blood and so the causes of that can be quite variable most commonly it can be low Blood pressure for a while can be transfusion reactions, uh, could be muscle injury or breakdown, such as in some a condition called rhabdomyolysis, where basically muscle cells break down, and release this uh, myoglobin into the bloodstream, uh, or it could be uh, sepsis, where you get an infection and your blood pressure lowers, lowering the blood flow to kidneys. So any of those are a possibility in our patient C, who uh, is the drug seeker. Muscle death. It, House, if you're watching this, are you looking for a new doctor? Call me. The MRI revealed an osteosarcoma, a cancerous tumor in your femur. It needs oh, so osteosarcomas can be devastating. They do usually affect young people, um, especially teenagers and young adults, and they are quite rare, but when they do occur, they can sometimes lead to people losing their leg or even their lives. And it's, it's basically, as she said, a cancerous tumor of the bone, and signs of it occurring are could be a lump or a swelling, bone pain during the night, or even locking of a joint as well. So if you have any of those, please do see a doctor urgently. And most recently, uh, Technoblade, who's a huge Minecraft YouTuber, unfortunately died of this disease. So it does happen. And it's thought to occur in young people because their bones are growing much faster in them. So it's, they're more likely to get an abnormal growth at the same time. And the earlier you catch it, the earlier you can do surgery and uh, the more likely you can save a life um, or a limb. And this is why with a simple sports injury, you're always more likely to do a simple x-ray because it's a small dose of radiation that can have a big impact on how likely you are to survive a condition like this. And working in the pediatric departments, we did see cases of sarcoma probably about once every two weeks. So it does happen, even though it's rare. Get checked out, don't take any risks. The lab test of your dog's saliva revealed a type of strep bacteria. It's commonly known as the flesh eating disease. Ooh, so uh, to be honest, usually you don't need to go through all of the uh, strain of finding the animal that bit, because I mean, yes, in this case, it's a dog, but it could be anything could be a stray cat could be even a tick can cause this disease and quite frankly you know that it's necrotizing fasciitis because you can smell it as soon as you enter the room luckily it's on tv we're not in the room with them but it does have a very strong smell his mri showed that the leg pain wasn't caused by the self-injection wasn't caused by an infection it was an aneurysm Plotted, leading to an infarction. Wait, is patient C a house? 
We have to do the surgery. Damn! Oh my god, what a plot twist! That is incredible. To be fair, that does remind me of a talk that a family medicine physician gave us in training where he was talking about him getting prostate cancer, having surgery and being left incontinent. I've never seen a group of students so interested by incontinence pads. Hearing a physician talk about their personal experience is just so compelling. So uh, no wonder we're so engrossed. And this just makes it so much more interesting. Four day blockage. Yes. It caused muscle cell death. When those cells die, they release cytokines and potassium. If you restore the blood flow, instead of just lopping it all off, then all that crap gets washed back into my system. The cytokines could cause organ failure and the potassium could cause cardiac arrest. On the other hand, I may just get the use of my leg back. So this is such a tough situation, but realistically, four days without arterial circulation is too long. The leg would no longer be viable and actually after about 12 hours, all the nerves, muscle, and skin supplied by the artery would usually have irreversible uh, injury. And so what he would also be suggesting is basically when those areas are injured, they release all of these cytokines and uh, chemicals that try and increase the blood flow back to the area as a response to stress and uh, a lack of oxygen but they can become toxic to the rest of the body if the blood flow is restored to the area and lead to multi-organ failure so he house is trying to take on a huge risk by doing this uh, making himself susceptible to reperfusion syndrome now the best way you can reduce your risk of being in this situation is to avoid cigarette like the plague. Over 90% of people with critical limb or acute limb ischemia have a history of smoking. Don't do it. So there's actually a reason why we mark the side and obviously we wanna see what side it is so we don't take the wrong leg off but there was a story back in england in 2002 where a kidney surgeon or urologist basically took out the wrong kidney on a 69 year old war veteran and basically left this poor bloke with no kidney function whatsoever what there was a medical student in the operating room that actually suggested that they were making an error and they didn't listen and told her to be quiet and said that she was mistaken when actually it was them who were and two surgeons got struck off unfortunately the patient didn't make it and they only realized that they'd taken out the wrong kidney when two hours after the operation the patient went to the intensive care unit and uh, wasn't passing any urine. So it's situations like those that make us realize that we need to listen to every member in the team, no matter how junior they are, and make sure not to make anyone feel like they're inferior or they can't speak up because everyone's opinion is vital. Always listen to your juniors. <laughs> I love how he's labeled his other leg as well. Oh, very clever, very clever. Bravo, script writers. They gotta hop that morphine. The doctors say they can't. Doctors don't recommend it. Bed rest and antibiotics. If you're in pain, you're not thinking right. That's why he needs uh -huh. a damn morphine. See, this is the reason why even if a patient consents for a suboptimal procedure, as a surgeon, you can't in good faith go ahead and do it if you know it's not the right thing to do. And there's a reason for that. I mean, every single doctor has taken an oath called the Hippocratic Oath, and as part of that, um, we say primum non nocere, which means first, do no harm. And by doing an operation where the risks far outweigh the benefits, uh, that is unfortunately what you're doing. That being said, everyone loves a bit of rogue doctoring and it makes for some good television. So why not go ahead? 
Okay. Dose. Or I go into white complex tachycardia. I could get in trouble. Listen, it's not a narcotic. Oh, I'm not looking for a buzz. Soon. You got about 20 seconds. The head intense music. Who's wrong? House has high potassium in his bloodstream because he has that renewed circulation to his leg and that destabilizes the charge within the heart and can cause it to go into abnormal rhythm, lead to cardiac arrest. What that medication, calcium gluconate does is it stabilizes uh, the outer layer of the cells so that the um, heart cells are preserved, but only temporarily. So to be able to actually fix the charges, you need to get rid of that excess potassium. You can do so by giving glucose and insulin, as well as a drug called salbutamol, and that changes where the potassium actually is within the cell. Otherwise, you need to keep repeating the doses of calcium regularly. High potassium can be fatal very quickly, and it's so important to keep the level stable in the blood. So dreaming while under anesthesia is actually really common. It can happen in up to 30% of people. Some people actually worry that when they're gonna go under, that they're gonna give away all their secrets while they're sedated, but that doesn't usually happen. Although while people are waking up, they can be a little bit loopy as I'm sure you've seen the TikTok videos. <laughs> what happens after he's in the coma? We'll obviously monitor his condition closely, and uh, if he can get through the next 48 hours without another cardiac incident. I mean, I'm his healthcare proxy. I get to make medical decisions for him if he's not able to. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. That's not how it works. So, if you're a healthcare proxy, you can make emergency medical decisions when the patient hasn't been able to give their opinion, um, or if the patient doesn't have capacity basically to make a decision then you your opinion is definitely taken into account but when a patient has really quite obviously made their opinion clear and then you put them in an induced coma so that you can then override that medical negligence lawyers will be rubbing their hands together and looking keenly on that case because <laughs> uh you will be giving up compensation. That is not okay. Okay. I love you. I love you too. I'm sorry. Ooh, see, that I'm sorry there. See, she hasn't done anything to him yet, but she knows that as soon as he gets knocked out, she's gonna override his decision. Um, and he has the right to make what we think is a stupid decision. We cannot override that as something called autonomy, which is another principle of medicine. Um, but thinking about from a medical side, like some of these medical decisions are just so tough. I mean, especially like during pandemic, like having to make the decision on if there are two patients who need just one bed on ITU, who will live and who will die. It's something that you need to be okay with and need to be able to sleep with that night. And honestly, it's, it can be very hard. And that's why when medical students are applying, we always look to see to make sure that they have some extracurricular activities or good social support around them to get them through these really tough life decisions and what is quite a challenging career, even though it's just, I mean, it's pretty cool. Let, let's be honest. I'm not gonna say the stereotypical thing and say it's so rewarding, but I mean, in a way, it kind of is. It's good, but hard. There's still some risk of reperfusion injury, but- Give me the forms you need signed. Dodgy. You're saving his life. He won't see it that way. 
Yeah, so, I mean, going in, taking out the dead muscle basically means that they get rid of all of that extra necrotic tissue that has a risk of being infected, leading to sepsis. And to be honest, she is basically saving his life by making that decision. Although, you know, <laughs> he's definitely going to be frustrated at that. Clearly, he would have a significant loss of function. Uh, he'd be much weaker without that muscle, but it's not doing him much good anyway, since it's already necrotic tissue. She had no right to do that. She had the proxy. She knew he didn't want the surgery. She saved his life. Oh, we don't this hospital is a medical negligence lawyer's playground. I don't know that. Maybe you would have been fine. It doesn't matter. It's the patient's call. The patient's an idiot. They usually are. You have a buzzer or something? What time's this class in? 20 minutes ago. To be honest, I would have stayed back to watch his class because, I mean, that's so interesting. Honestly, this episode has really been quite miraculously put together. I feel like some professor of medicine actually put this whole uh, storyline together. It's very well thought out. Some of the medical parts are just so nuanced with the differential diagnoses. Um, and this episode in particular didn't focus much more on the story building and much more on the medical side, uh, although it did include that interesting twist warehouse was patient C. Hope you've enjoyed this episode. Let me know in the comment section below if you want to see any other particular one. And I'm gonna use the magical algorithm to suggest you a video right here. So check that out if you want to keep the cognitive wheels turning. Hit a like if you've enjoyed and sub for more goodness. I'm Saramed and I will see you later on. Stay healthy, stay happy, don't smoke. Take care.